Don't be in a, in a race to finish something. Sometimes you got to meditate on God's Word. Sometimes you read a chapter and the next day you got to go back and reread it again. Prayer is our connection to omnipotence. That's why we need to pray. If people don't pray, if Christians don't pray, what is that saying? and dominion, O oh God. Hallelujah. All the glory that's due to your name, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name, O oh God. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Sit enthroned on the praises of your people, O oh God, tonight. We acknowledge you as Lord of all. We acknowledge you as creator and supreme over all the earth, O oh Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. Father, continue to be with us, O oh God, in this service. Continue to manifest your presence, O oh God, until everyone knows that you're here, O oh God. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I was thinking today and meditating on the fact that how important it is to have people and things that you can rely on in this life. It's good to have things that you can rely on in this life. And when something that you're relying on gets pulled out from under you, it's a very, very, um, it's a bad feeling. Because you were relying or counting on something or someone, and it failed. It wasn't there. And that creates a problem and a crisis in our life. You know, today, like Timmy said, uh, marks seven years that we opened the doors on a Sunday here at Deepwater's Tabernacle. And we didn't know um, what it was going to be like because we didn't uh, do any advertising. We didn't, uh, we didn't try to steal any folks from anywhere. We just prayed opened the doors, showed up, and um, God uh, brought people who were meant to be here. Now, as you can imagine, in, in seven years, a lot has happened, good, bad, and ugly. And uh, me being in uh, church so long and being in ministry for such a long time, I knew that uh, a Birthing a, a work from the ground up is no joke. Uh, I'm thankful that um, I'm thankful for one thing is that I didn't start this church. I just showed up where God uh, uh, told me to show up along with my wife and my family. We just uh, heard from God and believed God and, and came. Of course, everything with fear and trembling, trusting God. And, um, you know, I have a lot of friends who um, I grew up with who started churches, who went into ministry, and I was very happy with what I was doing. Thank you very much. Um, I saw, you know, their struggles, their hurts and pains, um, people that uh, you think are, are going to be there, that are going to help you and join and you can rely on, and all of a sudden um, they're not there. And all the things that you thought you'd have maybe are not there. But at the end of it all, you find out that God is still there. Amen. And the lesson there is that uh, while we thank God for uh, people and the people that he sends to uh, uh, join in the work and put their shoulder to the wheel, ultimately our reliance is on the God of our salvation. How many say amen? Our reliance and our trust is in Jesus. As much as we try, right, including me, as much as we try not to fail each other, we do by default, not that we want to, but we have that 
issue, don't we? As human beings, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. Um, we uh, hurt one another, and sometimes when people get hurt, they leave, and, um, and that hurts. So I want to give you the secret of what keeps me going, not just for the church, but for my life. Because in case you haven't noticed, life has many twists and turns and ups and downs and downs and downs and then ups. And you get turned around. So I'm just going to read to you one verse and talk about what keeps me going every single day. Every single day of my life. No matter what's happening, good or bad. And don't get me wrong. Don't look at me like, a, oh, wow, he has it all together. No, I run to the throne of grace to grab on the horns of the altar when I have to. And it's often. <laughs> it's often. Because what I confess to you, uh, I can't be mentioned in the same sentence as him, in my opinion, but the, the same thing that the Apostle Paul confessed, I confess. I'm weak. But when I'm weak, he is strong. And his power is made perfect in weakness. Amen? Here's the verse. Psalm 136, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Can we read that together? Let's read it. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Everybody now, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. So I want to tell you tonight that you can rely on the goodness of God. You can rely on the goodness of God. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His goodness, by the way, God's attributes are not like we understand them to be. Right? When, when uh, 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 the rich young ruler who went to Jesus asked him what he had to do to be, come into the kingdom of God, he called Jesus good teacher. And uh, this young ruler who was rich wasn't recognizing Jesus as who he was. He was recognizing him as a teacher, but he put the word good in it, and Jesus said, why do you call me good? In other words, why are you calling me good if you think I'm just a teacher? Only God is good. Let me tell you about the difference between what we think is good and the goodness of God. In Exodus 33, Moses is uh, asking God after he, he's getting the Ten Commandments and he's been in God's presence, he had the nerve, good for him, to ask God to show him his glory. And it says in verse 18 of Exodus 33, then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. Goodness is the core of who God is. It's not that, he's, that he has goodness in him. He is goodness. It's who he is. You can rely on it. It doesn't change. It's not good today and not so good tomorrow. If any of us can claim any goodness, I don't know who can. It doesn't last very long. We do good in little spurts. But goodness is 
in the very core of who God is. God's goodness, listen, this is, I'm giving you my secret to life here. God's goodness is why you can remain strong through adverse circumstances. When things go south, you can remain strong because of God's goodness. Because his goodness affects things. His goodness affects circumstances. His goodness affects situations. His goodness turns things around. And we have many examples of that. One was Joseph after being uh, sold into slavery by his brothers. After Joseph, uh, God brought him through and made him second in command to Pharaoh. The brothers were afraid, thinking that he was going to get back at them. And he said something that we should never forget in Genesis 50, verse 20. He told them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So when you are... In God's hands, when you entrust your life into God's hands, and even somebody tries to harm you or hurt you, the goodness of God will turn it around so it'll turn out for your good and the good of others around you. And I can testify to that so many times in my life when Things were done to me, and I gave them to God. God turned it around for my good. Don't ask me how he does it, because I have no clue. But he takes your situations and your circumstances or what somebody did to try to get to you, and instead of knocking you down, it lifts you up somehow, because God's goodness turns it for your good. That keeps me going when things go wrong or when someone comes against me. It keeps me going. I I don't fret. Why? Because God is good. And his love endures forever. And guess what? I belong to him. I am his possession. He purchased me. He chose me. He chose you. If you're here today and you know him and your eyes have been opened to this salvation, he picked you out. And if he picked you out, if he went to that trouble of picking you out when nobody else would have picked us out, there was nothing to pick us out about. It's just because he's good. And if he bothered to pick you out, do you think that he's not watching over you? Every step, everything that happens. And yeah, life does happen. I can testify to that. But somehow, some way, the goodness of God turns it for my good and for the good of others. How many say amen? God's goodness is why you can remain strong when things go south. God's goodness is your confidence that the Lord will always take care of you. How many know that God will always take care of you? Do you doubt anybody here doubt that? Have you had doubts? Be honest. Oh, yes. Yes, we have. But I want you to now think of the goodness of God so that your your doubt can go away. Psalm 31, 19 says this, How great is the goodness of God. You have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. How great is he has goodness stored up for us. He has goodness stored up for you. And he, you know what lavish means? He pours it out without measure for your protection and for my protection. How many have ever experienced 
God's protection through his goodness. Raise your hand. Oh, praise God. Who is it for? For those that belong to him. Who are those that belong to him? Those that fear him. What does that mean? Those that reverence him. If you belong to him, you reverence him. Amen. God's goodness is your confidence that the Lord will always take care of you. So see what I'm saying when things go wrong? It's the goodness of God that keeps me. Wait, wait a minute. This is God is good. And I belong to him. This is somehow going to work out. God's goodness is also your guarantee that you will experience goodness in this life. Don't give up on this life yet. Even though we're just passing through, you will experience goodness here. Oh, yeah, what was waiting for us is unimaginable. It's unbelievable. It's indescribable what's waiting for us when we go, go to see Jesus face to face. I can imagine, you know, we were driving down, Missy and I, a few times down some roads. You know, when I was in New York, you had to drive upstate if you were in the city to see all the foliage. But over here, it's right there. And so you just drive by and you see all these amazing colors. I was driving down this little road uh, from my house when I come to the church, and I had to just stop and put my, my phone out the window and take a picture of the beauty of God. Guess what? That's nothing compared to the colors that we're going to see in heaven. You can't even imagine what that's going to be like. But we are going to experience his goodness here. How many have experienced the goodness of God here on this earth? It's just to help us down here a little bit. Psalm 27, 13 and 14. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Guess what? This is the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. That's what keeps me. That's what keeps me strong. That's what keeps me taking heart, not losing heart. That I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Guess what? When I'm in heaven, when we are all in heaven, we're just going to be surrounded by the goodness and the glory of God. Here we need his goodness to help us through. How many say amen? Then, of course, we know the famous Psalm 23 and the song that we sing. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You know what? I have to confess that. That even though there's been a lot of times in my life where it got really dicey. You know what I mean? I mean dicey. Like, uh-oh, this does not look good. But I can, looking back, looking back, I can say that the goodness of God has followed me all the days of my life. I can say that with conviction because it has. And you know, I believe you have too. There's a song that we sing here. It's called The Goodness of God. You know it. And I've noticed that what happens to me happens to a lot of you when we sing that song. You start thinking back. And you start remembering all the good things God has done for you. And you, and you begin to break a little bit and, you, and your hands lift up to give him praise and adoration. But wait a minute, have you been through a lot of trouble? Yeah, yeah. But his goodness has carried me through. How many, looking back, have nothing but thanksgiving to give to God? Would you raise your hand and give him glory? <clears throat> You know, there are many of us here 
that through decisions that we made or situations that uh, came up through our fault or through no fault of our own, doesn't matter, we shouldn't be here today. We're here by the grace of God and by the goodness of God. How many can testify to that? Amen. Tim, if you'd come, I want to pray tonight. So you can rely on the goodness of God. And of course, you know what the second thing is. You can rely on the love of God. The second part of that first verse is that his love endures forever. That's a powerful word. You know, there are people in your life who once told you that they love you, but it wasn't forever. It was just for a little bit or until things got hard or until they changed. But there's one thing that you can bank on, and that's that the love of God for you will last forever. There's nothing that can change that, nothing that can take that away. You know, we as human beings, when when someone loves us or when we believe that someone loves us, you let your guard down, don't you? When you really know that someone loves you, you let your guard down and, and, and you begin to rest knowing that there's nothing, at least you think, that will turn that person's heart away from you. There's a confidence and a rest I feel that way about my wife, the way she loves. She loves hard. But she's not God. I really believe she'll never turn. But you know, she might lose a screw or two. <laughs> she won't by the grace of God. Let me tell you, you can absolutely let your guard down with God. Because there's no love like the love of God. There is no love like the love of God. The love of God humbles me. It breaks me. It, it, it makes me praise him because I know it has never changed from the time that I was a young man, through my hard days, through my rebellious days, through my sickness, through my disease, through my hard-heartedness, through my mistakes, through my toils, through the traps that I fell in, through my, his love never, ever stopped. never stops. My opinion, it should have stopped. It should have stopped, but it doesn't. Not for me, not for you. It's unexplainable. It's unfathomable. But it's undeniable. And that love is brought to full expression by this fat sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Didn't the word say that while we were yet sinners, he died for us? While we were in rebellion, he died for us. While people were shaking their fists at Jesus there in real time when he was here on earth and spitting on him, he died for them. And if they would just confess his name, guess what? they would be saved as well, even though they did that. 
Jesus himself said, greater love has no one than this, that you give your life for your friends. And his life was the most precious life because it had no sin. So let me tell you what happens because Jesus loves you unconditionally. Because he does, you can trust him with your deepest hurts and your deepest failures. You can trust him with your deepest hurts and your deepest failures. Nobody knows me like Jesus. You know, those that are real close to me know a little bit of the junk. But God, he knows everything. He knows everything that's in the closet. He knows the motives of my heart. He knew them then. He knew what I was thinking. He knows my failures. But his love is so deep and so enduring that I I feel safe telling him everything. Also because he knows it anyway. (laughs) You might as well fess up. He knows everything we've ever done. What a good place to go to unload yourself. Listen, don't be silly. Don't hold on to any hurt. Don't hold on to anything that you fail that you're punishing yourself about. Just unload it to God. He knows about it anyway. The best place to go. Psalm 31, 7 says this, I will be glad and rejoice in your love for you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. God sees it. He sees our affliction and he even knows what's going on in here, the anguish. Amen. Also because Jesus loves You unconditionally, you can find healing for those hurts and failures. That's the awesome thing about God. You know, down here on this earth, we have people who go to school to learn how to listen to people and how to uh, talk people through situations. They're called counselors, uh, therapists, psychiatrists, whatever. You can tell them your hurts and pains and hope that they won't tell it to anybody else. But they can't do anything about it. With Jesus, you can find healing for your hurts and your failures. Listen to Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. In other words, we thought God was punishing him, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. How many had some wounds that Jesus has healed? you give him glory and testify. If you still have some open wounds, let God heal them tonight. He not only knows about them, you can not only go to him and un- un- just unburden yourself, but he's the only one that can heal your soul. And because Jesus loves you unconditionally, your hope is always alive no matter what's going on. 
in the most trying of circumstances, you never lose hope. I'm telling you how I live on a daily basis. I've had the bottom fall out. I haven't fallen through because his hand has been there. But I haven't lost hope. I can't because God is my God. Jesus is my Savior, my Lord. I, I can't lose hope because he's with me. How many say amen? Listen to Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 20. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. How many can just <laughs> sympathize with that one verse? Yet, I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercy never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercy begin afresh each morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're going through something today, remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. And his mercies never stop. And I want to close with this. Because Jesus loves you unconditionally, you can have confidence that come what may, you and me, we're going to finish our race in victory. We're going to finish our race in victory. How many want to testify that when we say amen? amen. Romans 8, 35 and 37. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Can we God praise right now.